بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي This is a tafsir show and inshallah today we will be covering the 22nd juz of the Holy Quran wherein having started Surah Al-Ahzab the chapter regarding the confederates Yesterday we will be continuing on with that into the 22nd juz as it continues in the Quran. Then inshallah we will be covering Surah to Saba and then Surah Fatir. And the 22nd juz actually begins or within the 22nd juz Surah to Yaseen begins and inshallah we will cover that tomorrow. Surah to Al-Ahzab as I mentioned yesterday is a Madani Surah. It is a Surah which was revealed in Medina and many of the Surahs and many of the chapters that were revealed in Medina are such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shifts the attention away from Tawheed Risala Akhirah, shifts the attention away from mentioning laws, mentioning things about uh, Tawheed, about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Risala, prophethood, and Akhirah, the hereafter. Although mention is made in there, and mention is made throughout the entire Quran, because one of the purposes of the Quran is to ingrain those three concepts into the believer, into the person who is reading. But in Medina, as was the case in Rasulullah's life, now many of the injunctions started coming down because the Muslims were living apart from the Quraysh of Mecca. They had their own city, they had their own place. And the believers of Mecca, Medina, the Muhajirun, the people who had lived in Mecca, their belief had become firm. The 11 years that they had stayed, the 9 years that they had stayed in, in Mecca, was such that it had made their belief firm, it had uh, ingrained their belief within them, and now in Medina, all they had to do on top of that was add on the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were ready to accept. So in Surah Hazab, there are many, many different uh, commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. Some of them are related to Rasulullah's wife, some of them are related to his marriage, some of them are related to etiquettes, some of them are related to talaq. Then we have a few a bit of mention about Rasulullah's position as the as the Nabi, as the leader of this Ummah. And then we also have some ayat relating to hijab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these different ayat. Allah Azza wa mentions these different things so that the person may take them and may practice upon them. These ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned are such these commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are such that we are supposed to read them and take heed and try to practice upon them. Allah Azza wa Jal begins the 22nd juz in Surah Ahzab or just before even the beginning of the 27, 22nd juz Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about his wives. Now what happened was because there was an increase in wealth in Medina due to several victories or several victories in battle several victories wherein spoils of war were gained and brought back to Medina some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ decided to ask Rasulullah for an increase in their nafaqa, for an increase in the money that they are, they are given to spend. And they came, unto, they came to Rasulullah and they asked. Now, on one hand, it is perfectly right, it is perfectly fine for a wife to ask her husband for an increase in her nafaqa, for a wife to ask her husband that she may be given something. But this is Rasulullah ﷺ. And these are the wives of the Prophet. They are held to a higher standard. And because of that higher standard, they say in, in Arabic, Hasanatul Abrar, Sayyatul Muqarrabin, that the good deeds of the pious are actually the bad deeds of the ones who are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that they are bad, but in the sense that they are considered to be low for the people who are the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For a pious person, they may do, they may recite or they may perform. Say, for example, two rakas of tahajjud. And that would be good. Hasanat al abrag It is their good deed. But for the people who are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only reciting two would actually be a bad thing. Because their habit is eight. Their habit is far much more than that. Their habit is reciting or performing salah for a portion of the night. A given time of the night. So for those people, it would almost be like a sin. Meaning in the sense that it's something that's been removed. For them to only recite or perform two rakat, it would be less than what they usually do. It would almost be a sin for them or it would be akin to a sin to them. So this is 
the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they are held to a higher standards. That's why Allah subhanahu wa taala also says, "Liyudh inna ma yuridu Allahu liyudh hiba an kum rijsa ahl al bayt." Allah subhanahu wa taala wishes to remove from you any every kind of impurity. Impurity here doesn't mean physical impurity. Impurity in the sense that every kind within a person, within the heart of a person. So Allah subhanahu wa taala refers to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah azza wa jalla instructs Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to tell his wives that. إن كنتن تردن الله ورسوله والدار الآخرة فإن الله أعد للمحسنات من كنا أجرا عظيما. That if you wish for the for the hereafter, if you wish for Allah and His Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم and the place to come, then فإن الله أعد للمحسنات من كنا أجرا عظيما. Then Allah عز وجل has promised for you for the ones who are محسنات amongst you, Allah سبحانه وتعالى has promised for you a great reward. Then Allah says, "Ya Nisa and Nabi, man yati min kunna bi fahisha tin mubayyina tin yudha'af lah al adhabu dhaafin, wa kana thalika an Allah yasira." Also, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "In kuntunna tuqidna hayat al dunya wa zinatha, nuwafi wa zinatha, fataalina umatya kunna wa usagli kunna sarah hanjamila." That if you wish for a portion of this world, if you wish for something which is temporary, as is the dunya, then Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say that they will be given that. And they will also be told to go in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will instruct Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to divorce some of his wives. Now this was specifically aimed at the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was directed to them in a manner, in a manner that was befitting of them because they have a high station, because they are supposed to, because of the station that they have in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person is supposed to act accordingly. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them this. To inform them that you are the wives of the Prophet, Allah. In another place, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions at the beginning of Surah Azab, wa ummahat wa nisa'uhu ummahatuhum. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions, and Nabi you awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. That the Nabi is is foremost amongst the Muslims, and his wives are the mothers of the believers. And this was a station that Allah Allah Azza wa Jalla had given. To the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so they had to act according to the station. And Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions this here. Allah also mentions Ya Nisa and Nabi la stunnak ahadim min al Nisa that O wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you are not like any other woman. You are not like any other or anyone else from the women of of Medina, but also from any other women anywhere else. Uh, and again, all of these different ayat are pointing towards the same thing. That the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a special place. Then moving forward, Allah subhanahu wa taala gives an ayah here, and this is a special ayah in which it is the only place where any of the Sahabi, where any of the Sahaba, or any of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are mentioned in the Quran. Zaid radhiyallahu anhu, Zaid radhiyallahu an, is mentioned in the Quran. The reason he's mentioned is because he was the adopted son of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and there was a common belief. Amongst the Arabs, that once a person was adopted, once a person was taken in, then that person, that son, that adopted son, would now become like a real son. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in the very first few verses of Surah Hazab, and then again here, is making it clear that that is not the case. That this tradition needs to end. That this custom is not true. That an adopted son, he has a position within the family, but he is not like a real son. And that means that the laws that apply to a real son, or the laws that apply to a, a person that is not part of the family, meaning an adopted son, would also apply to the adopted son. Uh, and the laws that apply to a normal son do not apply here. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is mentioning that at the beginning, and Allah mentions that here. Why? Because his wife Zainab bint Jahash, Zaid radhiyallahu an, had married her, and then he had divorced her. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had tried very hard to keep them together. He had tried very hard to keep them together, but unfortunately, they could not live together, and so they could not reconcile, and they divorced. Or Zaid radhiyallahu an divorced his wife. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala, in a special union, in a special marriage, Allah azza wa jalla Himself says, "Zawajna kaha that we have married her to you," and Allah azza wa jalla marries Zaid bin Tijahash radhiyallahu anha to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now. Many of the Munafiqun, many people around there came out and they said, "How can Muhammad marry his son's wife?" And Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is mentioning here that that is not his son; it is perfectly okay. 
for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to marry a woman of his the or the former wife of his adopted son because it is not his real son. And one of the reasons why Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam married different women uh, in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life in the seerah we find that many of the women that he married were in some cases were sort of not not to say political but to bring certain people close to him. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's daughter was married. Umar radiallahu anhu's daughter was married. Uthman radiallahu anhu he married two of his daughters to him. Ali radiallahu anhu he married a daughter of his to him. Likewise, the different one of the uh, one of the women that he married was uh, was from the tribes of the from the tribes of the Jews and the tribes of the people who are living there again to bring them closer to Islam. So some of these marriages that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also some of the Prophet's marriages were to widows, people who had no nothing to support themselves with, they had no income, they had nothing to look after themselves with. In fact, one of the things or the contentions that many people who speak out against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they say that he was a womanizer, na'udhu billah, that he was a person who used his position to try to secure marriages uh, and to fulfill his desires. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's marriage after Khadija radiallahu anha, famously Khadija radiallahu anha herself was a woman who was his senior, 15 years his senior. But even past that, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's wife, beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, after that, his first marriage was actually to Sauda radiallahu anha. And she was a woman in, in her late age, meaning she was almost past 50. She was a woman who had been a widow. And Sauda radiallahu anha, it is impossible, it is inconceivable that the, that the person might say that this man, that this Nabi is marrying people for or to fulfill his desires. He is marrying someone who is in her 50s, who is, who is far into her life. Uh, and also who was a widow as well. Uh, and he supported her and he brought her into his family and so that he could support her. Many of the different, like I said, many of the different women that Rasulullah married, there were reasons behind the marriage. There were reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Rasulullah to have those nikahs, to have those marriages. And same way here, Zainab bint Jahash was brought into the household of Rasulullah because one was, she was already in the household, meaning she already had a station within the household. But also number two, it was to prove that point that the adopted son is not part of the family in the same way that the actual son, the blood-related son is. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ لِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not the father to any one of you. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not a father to any person here. And again, this is an important ayah in that it proves or it negates any inheritance of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam only had a female lineage. Uh, and in Islam, the lineage of a person continues mainly the family and the lineage of a person continues through the male lineage. This was a contention. This was a thing that. The Quraysh of Mecca used to insult Rasulullah about, but this was in fact a place or a thing that Rasulullah can, can hold with pride. That even though he had no male lineage, his remembrance is and continues on to this day. But besides that, one of the benefits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have put behind Rasulullah not having or continuing with a male lineage, that not, have, not being a father to any male generations coming besides him or coming after him, is that a person or that person will not be put on a pedestal. That those people will not be put on a pedestal. Naturally we have some within, within the fold of Islam and outside the fold of Islam who claim that certain members of the family of Rasulullah certain male members through his female lineage, through Fatima radiallahu anha are almost on the level of Rasulullah that they are at that position or at that, at that place. We will say that that is not possible. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ he is not a father to any one of you. And also, وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ And also Allah proves this in the next part of the verse. He is the messenger of Allah. He has no special place, meaning he is not any special human being. He is just a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He is just a messenger of Allah. وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ And he is a seal of prophethood. He is the one who has sealed off prophethood. That's it. It ends there. And there is no more after that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that there. Then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in a different place moving swiftly forward there's some ahkam related to talaq 
There's also ahkam related to who Rasulullah is allowed to marry, who he's not allowed to marry. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tadakhulu buyuta nabiyyi illa an yu'dhana lakum ila ta'amina ghayra nadhirina ilah. Walakin idha du'aytum fadakhulu. فَإِذَا طَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشْرُوا وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثِ What used to happen was, many of the companions, many of the sahaba would come to Rasulullah's house, they would come to sit, to benefit, to gain from Rasulullah, and they would come there, they would eat a bit, maybe Rasulullah had called them to eat. But if you've ever looked at a mock-up, or a, a diagram, or a recreation of Rasulullah's house, Aisha radiallahu anha's house, or those hijr, those little houses that used to be attached to the masjid. If you've ever seen that, you'll see that the place is extremely constricted. Meaning you can literally fit a few people and that's about it. But the sahaba would manage to all come there, they would sit around there, and maybe they would sit part of the masjid as well, outside the door of Rasulullah's house. And Rasulullah was such that he would find it shy to tell people that, you know, maybe you've overstayed your stay, maybe you need to move on. Uh, and he would not be able to tell them. But they would sit and many of the sahaba would sit and they would continue to talk and they would continue to enjoy themselves, maybe eat. And after eating, they would sit there and talk and maybe benefit from Rasulullah as well. But Allah Azza wa Jal reveals this ayah. And Allah says at the end, وَاللَّهُ لَا يَسْتَحِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not shy from the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the sahaba that, you know, you come... You eat, that's perfectly fine. hadith. But after that, don't overstay your welcome. Don't overstay your stay. Rasulullah has things to do. And also, the wives of the Prophet are also there. And it's difficult for him to tell them and to tell the Sahaba to go. But also, the wives are there. It was difficult for them also in that place because there was not enough space even to put a, a veil, a place that they may stay behind in that area, in that house. So they would have to sit and they would have to sit awkwardly maybe facing the other way, uh, and Rasulullah and the Sahaba will sit there and talk. And obviously, it becomes a bit uncomfortable, it becomes a bit difficult for them. This is also a lesson for us. And Allah mentions this in a different place as well, that about entering people's homes, or also here, about overstaying our welcome, about the etiquette of the guest. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned here. And if Allah Azza wa Jal has mentioned it, there is a specific reason to mention it. Inshallah, later and in the 26th Jews, we will talk about or we will touch on the etiquette of the guests in relation to how Ibrahim السلام, looked after his guests. But here also, important thing that is mentioned, that when a person comes, many a times we may visit someone, many a times we may visit a sick person, uh, or it may be that we go to someone's house and we come to visit them, that is perfectly fine, in fact that is commendable, that is good. But unfortunately we have to, or sometimes, we may get engrossed in talking to that person, we may become oblivious to the fact that they are, or they were about to do something, or they need to do something, they need to go somewhere. And many a times we may cause them a great deal of inconvenience. So we should look after the etiquettes of being a guest as well. Not just the etiquettes of the house, but also the etiquettes of being a guest. Coming to a person's house at a time when it is suitable, ringing them beforehand, asking them, can I come? Asking them, are you free? for a certain period of time that I can come and visit, bringing a gift before you come, so that you may give it to them, that they may become closer to you, that tahadu tahabu, that you give uh, gifts, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase the love between people, making sure that when a person comes, they stay for a period of time, and then after that they leave. If a person has given food, that they eat, that they show that they are appreciative of the fact that they have cooked for them, that they have made food for them. And then they leave at a time when it is good. If the person is busy when they arrive at the person's house, then they also excuse themselves and they say that they come at a different time. Again, many a times we have to, we think about the etiquette or the rights of the host, but many, of the, many a times we don't think about the rights of the guests themselves. And this is very important. Sometimes a great deal of inconvenience can be caused. And unfortunately what happens is, what should have been a means or what should have been an avenue for increased love between two people ends up becoming the opposite that the person thinks, when is the person going to look go? And when they finally, finally leave, they let out a big sigh uh, and they're so happy, mashallah, that they've left. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the etiquette of the guest here. Then Allah azza wa mentions about 
إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما. Very famous ayah that is mentioned in every single Jum'ah khutbah. Allah and His Malaika send salutations upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a sunnah of the Malaika. Such a great sunnah. Such an esteemed sunnah. Such an incredible act that they send salutations upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah precedes this order, this command, by saying that he and the Malaika do it. So, all you who believe, will you not do it? All you who believe, all people of Iman, you believe in Allah, Allah, you believe in the Malaika, you believe that they are of such a high status. So why won't you do it? So why do you not want to become part of this sunnah? Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu O you who believe, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Send salutations upon him. Send salutations and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for peace and blessings. Upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is something which our lips should be moist with Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin Nabi al-Ummi So many different durood So many different durood that a person can recite Our Whenever mention of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is made Our hearts should beam with pride Our hearts should fill with that longing of meeting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam It should fill with that And that is the love that a person has for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That is a love that a person has That a Muslim, a believer A person who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Has for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam It is a unique love There is no person in human history That hundreds, thousands of years After that person has passed away That people love them in the same way That Muslims and believers Of Allah and His Messenger Love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam It is incredible, it is amazing There is nothing like it and the lens that we will go to to show and to express our love for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it is something that is ingrained within the heart of every single person with iman. If a person has iman, it is the next thing is that they have an incredible amount of love for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions. So moving swiftly on, Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions a verse commanding Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to tell the believers and the believing women to tell his wives and his daughters. Yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihin To cover themselves Jalbab or jalabibihin here Means to cover themselves fully Different mufassirin have mentioned about The laws and the ahkam regarding The covering of a woman Here it means Min jalabibihin If it's talking specifically to the women of Rasulullah's household It would have been to cover everything And that is again The station that they have The place that they have In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And in terms of nisa al mu'minin the ulama have mentioned that the face can be uncovered, that the hands can be uncovered. But here also, taking the meaning of jalabibihin, a person may take that meaning to be that a woman should cover every part, meaning also the face. And this is the highest level. And it takes a certain amount of taqwa in this time and age. It is quite difficult. A person may be given remarks, a person may be seen or looked at in a different way. It will be difficult. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that this is ذَلِكْ adana أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَا فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ that this is closer to that they do not become that they are not recognized and they are not annoyed, they are not affected, they are not told different things, and they are not um, that people don't come uh, and say things to them and try to annoy them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Illam Yantahil Munafiquna Wal Ladina Fiqulu Bihim Marav, Wal Mujifuna fil Madina, the Nuhri and Nakabihim Tumala Yujavirun Kafiha illa Kalila. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those people who have a disease in their heart. The munafiqun, وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ And it is apt that Allah Azza wa Jal has mentioned this ayah here immediately after the verse on hijab, the verse on covering of the faces, covering of the body. Why? Because, and this has been the case throughout Muslim history, that the Muslim women who cover themselves, those people who have a disease in their heart, they have constantly made the effort to try to unclothe that. Now if we look into more recent works, if you look into Orientalist works, if you look into the past 200, 300 years, colonialism in the Muslim world, in Algeria, Tunisia, in parts of Saudi Arabia, in parts of Arabia itself, throughout the Muslim world, we will find that many writers, many different people in the Western Hemisphere have written extensively about this idea, about trying to unclothe the Muslim woman, na'udhu billah. 
uh, and this is a sign of the marath in their heart this is a sign of the disease in their heart and if a muslim man if a muslim person if any person has that inclination has that thing about wanting for the women of the believers to to open themselves up more to liberate themselves in in a, in a way to have more freedom this is again a sign of that marath within that person this is a sign of that disease within that person and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referencing them in that way and allah says mal'unin that these are the people that are cursed that These are the people who are cursed in this life and in the hereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning very strongly That these are the people who have a disease in their heart uh, uh, And it is not right for a believer to have these kind of thoughts It is not right for a believer to be on this kind of manhaj This kind of idea, this kind of ideology That they, they wish or they expect or they want or they desire For the believing women to uncover themselves more than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moving swiftly on, we carry on from Surah Hazab into Surah Sabah. It is a Makki surah. It refers to the city of Sheba, the city of the woman who Suleiman spoke to and Suleiman called to Islam. And this is also Surah Sabah is the next Alhamdulillah. Now we mentioned earlier that there are five Alhamdulillahs in the Quran which you can split up into five different portions or five different Topics or main themes. We had the first one where we had Alhamdulillah and we had Surah An'am, then we had Surah Al A'raf, and then here we've got Surah Al Saba, which is the third Alhamdulillah. And also here, the general theme continuing from this one to the next one is that no one can overrule the decisions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that only He is worthy of worship. So when we talk about no one overruling the decisions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about Dawood alayhi salam, Allah azza wa jal mentions about Suleyman alayhi salam, about the jinnat, the jinns, who used to be under Suleyman alayhi salam, and finally the malaika. Allah mentions that Dawood alayhi salam, Allah had given him incredible power. He used to perform the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alongside animals. He also had... Uh, the power Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Wa lahul hadid." We had made iron soft for him, and again, historically, this is also the time, the Bronze Age. This was a time when metallurgy was was coming up amongst humans generally, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions here, "Wa lahul hadid." We had made iron soft for him that he could turn it or mold it as he wanted, like as though it was wax. So people used to think that Dawood alayhi salam with such power. Maybe he would have the power to have intercession in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, no, we gave him power, but that's it. Then Sulaiman alayhi salam, Allah had given him so much power as well. Allah azza wa had given him the power to speak to animals. Allah had given him power over the jinn. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him kingdom, dominion. Allah azza wa had given him the wind that he could take him to different places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him so much. So people thought maybe the Sulaiman alayhi salam might, ha- might have that. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, he did not have that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the jinn. People have beliefs about the jinn. That maybe they have ilm al ghayb that maybe they have knowledge of the unseen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no. And the example that Allah gives is when Sulaiman alayhi salam was standing at his palace and he was overlooking his jinn. He was overlooking them as they worked and they were fearful of him. And so that's why they continued to work. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he passed away in that state and he was leaning on his staff. But the jinn knew nothing of him, of him passing away. And only some time later, a considerable time later, when termites had eaten away at his staff, he fell down and they realized that he had passed away. So this proves that the jinn had no knowledge of the unseen. And again, this proves to the Muslims and the believers and the Quraysh that at the time thought that maybe the jinn had knowledge of the unseen. Maybe they had something different than what mankind had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, they did not have that. And finally, Allah mentions in this surah about the malaika, that the malaika don't have that as well. And the lesson that we take from that is, we do not put people on a pedestal. We do not people, put people beyond the rank that Allah azza wa had given them. If someone's pious, then the piety is there. If a person has a close connection to Allah azza wa if a person is accepted in Allah's court, that is there. But we do not associate to them that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not allowed us to associate to them. That is... Their position in this world is as it is. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is very clear that we cannot use them as an intercession. We cannot use them as something, as a medium to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions also in the next surah, surah Fatir, that there is no tasarruf. There is no idea of the spreading of duties. There is no idea of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's 
power being shared amongst different things. So this surah, surah to surah to Saba, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions these different things in this surah, and inshallah tomorrow we will continue with surah Fatir, uh, which means the Creator, and then surah to Yasin. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us all the power, all, all the ability to act upon these different ayat, these verses, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us the ability to take the lessons from the Quran.